Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to Maxie's Musical Podcast with my guest today, Chris Mars from The Replacements. If you like what you hear today, be sure to like it, share it, subscribe to it, tell all your friends about it. Remember to follow the show on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok for regular updates on future episodes. Today, we're brought to you by Metro Chrysler Dodge Jeep and Ram at Chicopee. Visit their state-of-the-art dealership between BJ's and Big Y on Memorial Drive or stop by MetroJeep.com and drive home in your new Metro Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram today. And now here's today's episode of Baxi's Musical Podcast. What is it? What is it? It's Baxi's Musical Podcast. So here's a sad reality for you. Do you ever meet someone who tells you in their spare time they dabble in creating art? For a lot of people, the first reaction to that kind of news is, oh, that's nice. And if the conversation goes any further than that, you might find yourself asking probing questions like, so what do you do, like craft fairs and stuff? Well, that's all very well and good for some people. But when the artist happens to create legitimate pieces of art, surrealistic expressionism that's been shown around the country in European art galleries around the world, then I suppose the insinuation of a roadside craft fair would be seen as somewhat of an insulting slap in the face. The bottom line is this. Don't assume anything until you see for yourself what somebody is capable of, which is why the story of Chris Mars is so important. Chris Mars is an artist, an animator, and a filmmaker who just released a book of his amazing artwork. The name of the book is 7.42 p.m., The Art of Chris Mars. His work is provocative, emotional, frightening, and beautiful all at the same time. Chris Mars is absolutely amazing, and the story behind his artwork is both very personal and incredibly compelling. Now, before you get your undies all in a bundle and say, hey, Maxie, isn't this supposed to be some sort of musical podcast? Well, yes, it is. Here's the other thing about Chris Mars. He's also the former drummer for The Replacements. In the 1980s, The Replacements were just about the most important band in America, responsible in part for introducing the country to the potential greatness of alternative music. College radio in the 1980s was jammed with dozens of great essential songs by The Replacements, releasing some of the best music of the decade with albums like Let It Be, Tim, and Please to Meet Me. The Replacements were a band that were inches away from becoming household names but they were also a band that was prone to spectacular bursts of self-sabotage. Like, for example, that time they were banned from Saturday Night Live for, among other things, being wildly overserved before showtime. The replacements were as reckless and as unpredictable as they were vital and essential. Between Chris, brothers Bob and Tommy Stimson, combined with the songwriting genius of Paul Westerberg, the replacements seemed to be going places and going nowhere quickly all at the same time. When the band broke up in 1991, they left an amazing legacy behind them. And while Paul Westerberg has since retired from music, Tommy Stinson and Chris Mars continue to produce music to this day. Tommy has toured with his own projects, Bash and Pop, as well as Tommy Stinson's Cowboys by the Campfire. He's also spent time as a member of Guns N' Roses, as well as Soul Asylum. Chris Mars, on the other hand, has focused mainly on his artwork, but has also produced some amazing albums of his own, including his latest record, The Average Album, which he self-released last year. This year, he'll be reissuing that record and making it available on vinyl. Like everything else that he has ever done, it is fantastic. But what you might not realize about Chris Mars is the astonishing skill and imagination that he pours into his art. This isn't just some guy selling velvet paintings of a bloated Elvis at a local gas station. This is a brilliantly talented artist whose work has the power to force you to find humanity in the face of intense suffering, to find beauty in the things that we might fear. When you look at what he's produced, you begin to understand there's far more to Chris Mars than just being the drummer for the replacements. And so, as a fan, I have to tell you, it is a real pleasure and a treat to speak with artist Chris Mars. From the replacements on Baxi's musical podcast. Yeah, I, I know it's almost 7.42 at night, and this is prime painting time for you, but I do want to thank you for joining me here today. I've been a fan of the replacements since the beginning, and so it's, I'm very excited to have you here tonight. I, I really appreciate that, and I'm just glad to be here. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, cool, I'll, man. 
Well, let me get this out of the way because I mean, I, rem- I remember seeing the replacements twice uh, in my life. This would have been like 85, 86, once when uh, when Bob was still in oh, the sure. in, in the band, and then, then one time, you know, after he left. And the first time I saw the replacements, I felt like I was seeing the greatest damn band in, in America. <laughs> and and the second time I saw the band. <laughs> I was too drunk to remember any of it, which I think <laughs> is the mark of a true fan of the replacements. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, that could be, uh, uh, you know, maybe that's where, uh, uh, you know, if, depending on the state of the audience and the state of the band, sometimes there can be harmony there. Right. People aren't I, quite uh, sure what they saw. <laughs> I wasn't sure of whether I was in competition with the band. <laughs> I heard just really inspired. I didn't know. Oh, man. You know, they, they, yeah, no, that was a, that was a good, a fun period you know uh that kind of the first part of it and then get you know it's when we're first starting out it's it's like you're still getting your chops we're still you know pretty young and so we're kind of starting to tour we started touring pretty early all in all but uh but that midpoint there you know is when i think we really started to kind of get better you know um on our instruments you know just from doing it so much so that was like a really sweet period i think you know and bob was still in the band bob stinson and stuff like that so yeah that, that was that was cool and i'm sure you all of you uh, you know understand how important the replacements were to kids back in 83 4 5 and 6 i mean in, in many many ways this was the band that kind of created college radio or, or kind of what college radio was all all about the whole minneapolis thing uh, was really imp- I mean, I went to school in in Milwaukee, not that far from oh, from okay. Minneapolis, and sure. there was something like indelibly important about wow. the replacements at, at like at that particular moment. It's really pretty remarkable. It's it's interesting how you know when you think back on that, and like you couldn't if we tried to recreate that for the life of us, we couldn't. You know, it's just a time and a place and an, and an attitude that's sort of collective and the right time or something, you know, but I mean, you know, you know, we, we just kind of, I guess, you know, how that goes. We, we, we were feeling what we were feel, feeling, you know, as far as like the world or whatever we were reacting to. And then, you know, if you, if you have a bunch of other people that are kind of coming up at that same time and it, everything sort of, uh, you know, coalesces, I mean, it's not going to happen for everybody, but we, we, we tapped into that, I guess. So. We loved playing, uh, you know, we didn't get to Milwaukee a ton, but we did get to Madison a lot. So yeah. I don't know if you ventured. The second time I think was, I think was in Chicago. Um, oh, okay. Chicago. Yeah. And so I, those were, those were always decent shows. I think, cause I don't know why we always did really well in Chicago. And I think maybe it was the, the, the nature of the audience sometimes, or maybe it was where we were on our tour kind of coming back home and we were in cert, sort of a certain spirit or whatever but madison was always really really good too we always had a great time there. yeah so wisconsin and chicago a lot, of, a lot of other places too but those two places in particular i don't think we did many bad crappy shows you know or what or i should say crappy what you know down whatever messed up, <laughs> <laughs> fucked up shows. well i mean you did plenty of those but <laughs> not, <laughs> yeah. not, not when i saw them you know the, yeah. the the story of the band is such a it's such a fascinating one in a lot of ways. It, it, it's amazing and exasperating at, at the same time, and yeah. you always seem to be straddling between greatness and then total self sabotage. <laughs> but but being in the middle of it, I have to believe, is a much different story. And I'm sure the, the mythology that has been built over the years is very different from fans than the reality. When you look back at it, and you're, you know, you're talking almost 35 years later, I mean, what are your yep. thoughts about what happened to the replacements? Well, you know, if I think about how we started out, why we started out, uh, you know, it's probably not too much too different than any band that starts out. And, you know, kids sort of just whatever, middle class kids, you know, in an inner city that, you know, want to do something besides... I don't know, get out of work in a factory or whatever the hell we were doing, you know, before we joined the band. And, you know, none of us had big prospects for like an education or anything like that. So we were the, we were the just kind of birds of a feather in that regard. And then, you know, again, it's, it's, I'm sure it's a, a common story, but then you get together and you start playing and then I guess the, you know, the, the right chemistry, you know, uh, lucky enough to have Paul in the band that joined, you know, a little later after me and Bob formed and then Tommy came along and there were a few other members that kind of came in and out for just a brief period. But, you know, we were lucky to land on the four of us um, chemistry wise. And, and that right when that happened, I think we could sort of sense something was, uh, you know, 
there was some sparks there. And then, and so that's early on, but again, that could be any band, right? Sure. <laughs> but, right. but, uh, you know, then we just, I don't know, we progressed the way we progressed and, uh, and, you know, we were lucky enough to, to tap into whatever we tapped into. And, and it is, you know, looking back, like you said, I, I'm not sure, you know, what, why, or, you know, who, you know, what, what we had that, appealed in a certain way to people but um i mean i get it more now and i understand it more now but in real time you just you're kind of in the middle of a band and you're trying to do the best you can you know <laughs> and trying to just sort of uh you know go along and, and 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 you 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 know you want there's a work ethic i think that we had to a certain extent and uh we we sort of pushed it you know i remember those early days were uh, they were, you know, sleeping on a lot of floors and, you know, not, not knowing where it was going to go, but it was still kind of better than whatever alternative in life we had. So we just kept on pushing. <laughs> when you, when you talk about Paul in the band and his role, obviously, you know, this is a guy who he was getting better and better as a songwriter as the, as the years go on. And suddenly you know, he's got a legacy, you know, behind him as, as you know, simply just as a songwriter. You know, yep, when you're seeing absolutely. that, when you're seeing that develop in somebody, and you've known this person for a long time, and you're a part of that development, mm -hmm. I mean, what's the feeling going forward? I mean, do you just place so much trust that this is going to keep going and keep developing, or does it become more difficult because you're waiting on one guy? Uh, no, no. I mean, because I think earlier on, we a lot of kind of the spirit of what we had in our sound. You know, in the way we played together, you know, Bob had a, a distinct style, and um, you know, I did the best I could with with uh, my tools. You know, uh, um, I, you know, there were certain influences that I had that I tried to, you know, pick up little pieces of favorite drummers that I had. So, you know, whatever con whatever in the conscious that we put into this band, uh, it, it's basically it was just uh, you know working together a lot at first. That probably helped all of us spark certain things but you know uh, for sure a chemistry but then like you said paul continued to write and to explore and came up with you know really some great pieces of songs and full songs and and then we all throw it into the mix into into whatever the washing machine that we are as a band and and it comes out the way it is the, the most fun i think that i had was the creative aspect of it the, the touring was never it was fun but the, the most fun for me was, you know, like you said, you know, here we are working on a song. We don't quite have it yet. And then maybe we adjust a few things and then, oh, bang, there it is. <laughs> it sounds this way from beginning to end. This is something, you know, and then some of them felt really great at first. And then others we kind of had to work on a little bit or, you know, we had to kind of, it was, and I guess from a standpoint of a drummer, some were more fun to play. I guess that would just be like, you know, any song going on, but no, as far as, uh, uh, you know, being lucky enough to have Paul writing, thinking, coming with, coming into the, into practice with, uh, you know, things to try out. And it was like invaluable. It was awesome. <laughs> it, it's, it's not surprising to hear you talk about the creative process being what was most important, most memorable for you. I mean, yeah. if you had told the, the, the 19, 20 year old me that the drummer for the replacements would one day grow up to be this amazingly brilliant artist, I don't think I would have believed you. Um, and, and I have I to, that. and I have to believe that there was probably a, a number of people that needed convincing, uh, you know, early on. <laughs> Tell me about the, the about your art background here, because I know this is something that, that you really have done since since childhood. But but where does this come from with you? This 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 creative drive in you? Yeah, I, it, it it's um, you know, I think what happens just like anything. I think with the with the band, a, a sort of a vision or a shape starts to happen. You know, between us or even individually, you kind of feel that this is like uh, this is a thing. You know, and then you're kind of. You're kind of you. You bring your hammer and chisel or whatever it is to kind of you know to knock your little piece out of it. And I think that's the same way with with the visual thing. I was always a natural drawer, and I would get in trouble a lot in school and grade school. Um, you know, and I was just obviously I couldn't. I wasn't a. I wasn't the best student because my mind was somewhere else right. most of the time. But you know, so the the, the drawing ability was always there. Um, but did I ever think that I was ever gonna? figure out i'd go to museums you know and, and look at you know, classic paintings or modern paintings whatever it was i i would just be stumped at how they achieved what they achieved and it was really fascinating to me so a hunger there always in the background in my head 
And then um, I never thought that I'd be able to one day harness, you know, the ability to oil paint um, and control it. So I was just, and that took probably until I was age 40, you know, before I figured that out. So lots of drawing, lots of things. But I think vision-wise, there's um, there's an aesthetic in my head, and a lot of it is, you know, probably from the time I grew up and, and you know, how they talk, we, we all talk about as, as artists, simultaneous ideas. I started seeing other artists, you know, even sometimes when I was on the road, like I, saw, I suddenly saw, I walked into a place and they had some Suco paintings, you know, or, you know, different, you know, Robert Williams, you know, a few, a few artists would pop up and I think, God, that, that feels like my sensibility. So again, it's like those simultaneous ideas that are out there that I pick up on, but then I have my own vision and, you know, in the back of my head and I can't get it out. I can't get it out. It's there. And then suddenly I, I can paint what's in my head very directly. And, and it just comes out how it comes out. <laughs> it's just, you know, it pulls me uh, along more than I push it. So it's, it's a very natural thing, more natural than, than music. I think music I have to kind of struggle and get lucky with. So I assume that when, people realize that or have heard the fact that you are an artist on top of being a musician. I, mean, I know in, in a lot of ways, you know, you, musicians are categorized and, and, and left to stay in a box where they can almost never escape. There must be people who say, well, you know, he's the drummer for the replacements. How good could that art really be? <laughs> but, but, you yeah. know, what, and I, I keep my my drunk nights. I keep those paintings in the closet. No, I'm just, just, just <laughs> to, to tell you the truth. Yeah, you know, all joking aside, I haven't I haven't drank. You know, and I'm I'm been sober for for decades. Yeah. So, you know, um, I and I and I kind of you know just I was noticing that I wanted to get somewhere because it was kind of post the band. You know, and and I was trying to do this other thing, and I was really my you know I just kind of couldn't control the urge to want to do it, and I couldn't and I kept. Get trying to get somewhere and couldn't, so I just one day I said, you know what, I'm going to try no more <laughs> alcohol. I'm going to try not drinking, <laughs> and that's when kind of I, my concentration really sort of uh, got a lot more honed, and I was able to remember and and try things. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. it's like you almost you're trying to catch a tiger by the tail, and then and you can't quite get it, and then suddenly I was able to kind of hold on to that tail and let it pull me. So. Well, you had mentioned that it was around the, the age of forty where it, it all started to come together was there a specific moment where you said aha this is what i i want to do and this is how i'm going to do it was there a moment that that changed everything yeah i think i think it was there was a, a very specific thing that i read and it was in an art, artist's handbook and i think about it to this day because it was the basically i read a it's like a you know it was like a pretty fairly thick book of all kinds of techniques and all kinds of different mediums and it was just uh, you know, tons of things. So I went to the oil painting section and then I read through it and how different people try different, you know, different uh, ways of doing things. And then I saw one little small paragraph where it says, you, you varnish the, the paint, the surface first instead of after a lot, you know, traditionally people make a painting and then they varnish it after, you know, to bring it out, bring the whole thing out. But this was like, you varnish it first and then you let it dry, and then you start to paint into it. And what happens is the oil medium reacts with the varnish, and it and it basically makes it liquid again. And then it and then the paint kind of goes into. So it was really a technical aspect that was that allowed me to finally be able to paint how I wanted to paint, to start to layer things up, and and then really start to get the detail, kind of the looseness and the detail both. Uh, were able to come out, and I could never get that prior to that. I tried acrylics, but it was always this, you know. And, and I'm, I'm when I'm painting, I hate when I when I put a mark down or a color down or something, and then a few hours later, it's all dull, and then it doesn't look as rich and dark. Right. And so this was a way. And the acrylics, I wrestled with that horribly, and I hated it. So because it would, it would in, in colors would dry a different color. So I would never able was I was never able to uh, get what I see in front of me. And then until I tried this technique where the, the, the colors went into the varnish and then they stayed that way, then I was able to launch from there. So then now I'm getting what I'm seeing, I'm seeing what I'm getting, and, and then it just took off. That was the moment. <laughs> you know, I, I've had a chance to, to go through the book over the last couple of days, 742, The, the Art of Chris Mars, and it, it's, it's just, it's incredible, and it's so powerful to go through and i want i want to talk about that more in a second here but Absolutely. before i sure. get into that i i, I want to talk about the decision to release 
a, a book of your work. How did that happen, and where did it begin? Uh, well, I have another book out, and, and it was about, I think, the first book that I have out uh, called Tolerance, and it's another you know book of a collection of paintings, and it's about maybe from a, a year like 1999 or 2000, right around there, up until about 2008 or nine. And so then um, after that, obviously, I did a lot more painting. So this book represents uh, the collection of like about 2009 through, you know, it's about another, I don't know, 2020, maybe right around there. So, uh, you know, uh, 10 or 12 years of, of work, um, you know, you just, you get, it, it, it just feels like, hey, it's time to put up an, uh, out another book. I've got a, a, a whole other collection of paintings. And so it, it just felt, felt like the right time yeah. to do it. Going through it and then, you know, also looking at some of the older work you've done on the website and, you know, also watching some of the, the animated films you've done online, the, the thing that is just so clear about every piece and, and every frame is that, like I said, you create incredible emotion out of this surrealistic chaos. It, it, obviously, that's not something you learn in, in, in a day, and you're creating something much more involved than just you know, a guy selling paintings at a, at a gas station in the parking lot. I mean, this is, th these paintings have developed over time. If you look at the early paintings, they're really, really good, but as you're going on throughout the years you see this remarkable development. It's amazing how you just have been able to funnel all of this emotion and put it on canvas with oils. I mean, I, I realize that oil is a medium where you know, a lot of artists feel very much more connected to it, whether artistically, emotionally, or spiritually, whatever it may be. But there is a big development in your artwork over the last few years. Is there a point where you say, all right, now I'm in... I'm in a real zone here and it's really starting to, I'm really starting to master what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I think there is. And I think that zone, I think if I look at the first book, I can see there's more fear in the painting. And, you know, cause I'm, I'm it's almost like you're afraid, like you have, you get something, you're afraid that it's going to go away. <laughs> so you <laughs> maybe try a little too hard or maybe it's a little more stiff in spots and maybe the color's not as adventurous, but I think by um, around 2010, I started to, in maybe 2012, I started to branch out. And then I think by around 2015 or 16, I really started getting way more adventurous and, and less scared of the colors and the shapes. So then that was probably the zone right there where I was really, you know, everything was just firing. And, and um, I was, I was kind of, you know, some of the combinations of color and shape were um, sort of surprising me in, a, in an interesting, you know, like in a new way. So I think that, yeah, that's definitely reflective in this book. But as far as the emotion, yeah, the, the emotion is like, it's probably everything in a life, you know. Um, mm -hmm. There's, there's uh, you know, my a lot of it, if you've read any of, of sort of my statements, it's, you know, there was a lot of um, things connected to sort of being an outcast, uh, you know, in terms of uh, living with a brother who um, was a schizophrenic his whole life and was institutionalized on and off and, my oldest brother. And so um, that was a, a big part of my life. And I didn't know how much a part of my life it was until I really started sitting down and meditating and painting and, and thinking about those things and, and how then that connected to the emotion of why I got in a punk band and, and that whole aesthetic and sort of the, the, the outsider, you know, um, you know, sort of uh, status of, of punk and so it all starts to go together, you know, after a while. It's, in it's interesting when you look back, it's like, oh, yeah, it all fits. <laughs> well, you know, I'm glad to hear you say that because I was kind of thinking on, in those terms. I, mean, I, I had read about things you had said about your brother and about his illness and, and also thought about, well, in, 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 very, in very real terms, the idea of an outsider as a, you know, a punk drummer or, you know, someone who was into music at that late 70s throughout the 80s, and then looking at how we as a society overlook or choose to ignore people who are confronting s severe mental illness as if we've put them on the outside. Yeah. There's a real humanity uh, uh, about it that tends to get overlooked. And, and, and the way that you've dealt with it, the, the images are frightening, but there's also a nobility about it, too. And, and, and the way you've described your brother and the inspiration that he's been to you in that is really very moving. I, I, I'm, I'm glad that that comes across because there's definitely a lot of, of love there that, uh, that was there and knowing my brother and knowing, 
you know, what he went through um, and the struggles that he had his whole life. And then also knowing when he, you know, he was episodic, uh, you know, when I was a younger kid and, and he was really funny and, and just, you know, there was a, there was an intel definitely intelligent and funny. And those were also so much of who he was. It wasn't just this label, you know? Right. And so I, and that was a real eye opener for me of uh, when, when people, yeah, when people maybe too quickly judge or, or label somebody that they're, it's very just, it, it can be very knee jerk and, and you just, you have to remember there's, there's people, you know, uh, there's, there's a, the, the dimension of a person is much more than, than a, a one aspect, um, you know, and I, and, and it's like, yeah. And if I, if I think about societal things that are going on, um, and how we treat that, or you know, the lack of care, you know, that that that's right. out there for people that are on the fringes. I mean, that's sad. I we I, we saw it in Minneapolis. There's a, you know, there's definitely a, a much more of a need for um, uh, you know, for helping people um, that that maybe used to be there and and went away. And I don't know what has happened. I don't know if it's funding or what's going on. But um, there's a, seems to be a lot more people on the street. And that's that's aside from drug problems and addiction that, you know, mental illness can result from all of that too. But when you're talking about just somebody that came into the world that with a, with a, with a, you know, um, a mental illness of, you know, various kinds, that's uh, sad when people can't find the right treatment, you know, or the love behind that. So there is in your paintings, the, the, the subjects of your paintings can be in, in some ways, you know, uncomfortable to look at. And, and and many appear to be like these exaggerated, tragic, and you know, occasionally grotesque figures, and and they're frightening in a way. But it's very hard to look at these pieces and not feel divided by that, you know, uh-huh. between discomfort and then also the compassion that comes out in it. And you know, that is so hard for most. I would say ninety nine percent of of artists to achieve that and to get that out of those of those paintings and you do that. And I think that's, I appreciate I, that. Thank you. Well, you're, you're welcome. But it, but I think that's what really separates great artists from just the guy, in the, the guy at the, at the, at the gas station parking lot. You know, th- this is something that you know, to, to draw something that elicits, you know, that emotion is remarkable. And what is really amazing is I've also heard you talk about creatively how these images seem to be coming to you, I and mean, it, it almost, in a way, seems almost like a, like an improvisational exercise. Like it's coming through you rather than from you. And I don't know if that's mm. if that's an accurate way of, of putting it. But as I've seen you talk about it, even seeing like the time lapse videos of you of you painting, it seems like these things are just being drawn through you. Is, I mean, is that an accurate yeah. way of putting it? That is that is an accurate way, and it is um, you know one thing I think maybe uh, and this probably is connected with the re- the replacements in a way where we were very bored as individuals, where we would get <laughs> bored you know on tour, and that was part of the reason we would fly off the handle and and do things to kind of maybe make it more exciting for us you know for better or for worse for the <laughs> for the audience. But um, I think. Um, for for me to to um, again it's 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 a boredom thing for me. Um, uh, there's all kinds of techniques that artists have, and 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 some artists will make a study, and then they'll make another study before they ever sit down to start blocking the painting. I cannot work that way, so I devised a method for me that is more like a storm that I enter, and it's it, part of it is how I treat the surface and the color before I ever even start putting imagery on there. There's like uh, uh, there's weather happening, you know, like a like a, a wind and things like that in the surface. The way I treat my surface and prep it with color and brush strokes before I ever begin. So then I enter this world, and then everything again because I, I could never be the type of artist that could do a study and then and then start to block it in. It, to me, it's way too confining to have to do that. Yeah. So it has it has to be spontaneous. And then so then as I'm painting it. The painting, I, I will go in with an idea, and I'll never, ever be able to stick with that initial idea. I might have an initial feeling, or like maybe, I, maybe I'm going to do a scene or I'm going to do a portrait. That's about as close as I can get to knowing where it's going to go. So then what happens is if I'm having a conversation of how I'm feeling and thinking and, and you know, and whatever my aesthetic is, and then whatever the surface is in, and that weather inside the canvas is telling me, then it's all spontaneous, and that's how I – and so it, then it starts to happen 
fairly quickly. So, um, you know, my technique allows me to not have to sit forever and redo things and reblock things in and out. And, you know, I just, that's not my process. So yeah, it's, it's, it does. And in that sense, it is kind of coming through me because it's such a, a, a conversation in real time rather than any sort of preconceived thing. So. You've had the chance to show your work at galleries all across the country and all across the world. And, and it has to be an amazing experience to see the reaction people have towards your painting. I mean, it's one thing to, to be doing it, you know, in, in your studio and your, in your painting. And it's another thing to see how people are actually looking at it and what their reactions are. Tell me uh, uh, about that and what it's, what it's like to actually view that. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. And, in, in, you know, by and large, you know, people kind of pick up on what I'm doing and I'm sure they've, you know, they've, most of them, that are there have a little bit of a working knowledge of my statement and kind of what, you know, what I'm trying to, to go, uh, tr trying to achieve, I guess. There's a lot of, I, I, it's amazing, there's a lot of people that have had members of their family that were schizophrenic or, you know, um, otherwise unique in, in, in another way. And there's a, there's a connection that, that they have to it immediately and which is really fascinating to me because so then that means that whatever I'm putting forth in whatever way I'm doing it, some someone else is picking up on it on that emotion. So uh, that that's that's really fascinating when that happens. Uh, but by and large, it's it's positive, and and people do are do often say what you say as far as they're drawn in, and maybe they're a little repulsed at the same time. And I think that's also you know maybe what I'm what I'm my intention is too is to have people be drawn in but maybe be a little uncomfortable and and that is a little analogous of how we as a society maybe don't want to wrestle but um you know with certain things that are uncomfortable but i'm maybe <laughs> i'm compelling the viewer to wrestle with that right. to come in and to investigate it and i think one of my tricks that i use is uh is emotion and I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a trick. It's, it's what comes out naturally because I think my work is pretty much expressionistic mixed with surrealism. And so there's a lot of expression, obviously, you know, in it. And a lot of it is in the eyes. And so eyes are very, you know, people connect with each other with eyes. And so that is definitely a, a, a tool that I don't know if I was conscious uh, to use, but it it definitely is something that I think you know may may be an aid to to have people at least connect with them, and then once they're connecting with the painting, you know, then to investigate further. So you've taken that a few steps further along with the the animation and the film projects that you've done over the years as well, using much of the same type of imagery and then applying it to like a, a very different visual medium, and it's really effective, especially if you're oh, trying to get the idea of someone with severe mental illness who may be having a psychotic break or, you know, have these, these episodes, you really start to get the sense, well, this must be what it feels like and what it sounds like and how it manifests itself. Tell me about, um, about how that began and, and also the development about it because the animation and the film work has become a lot more sophisticated over the years too. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, the, the animation is definitely, you know, now I'm, it's, you're, you're working with other elements, movement, you know, and, and words and sound. So it is kind of a nice way to marry music and, and imagery. So that, that's, that's, a, that's, I think, something that I was striving for and wanted to do. And maybe when I'm sitting down with a painting and the painting's not moving any more than I'm making movement myself in it, you know, incrementally. <laughs> but it's basically there and it's stagnant. So I think there was a hunger for to want to get into something visually where things move around a little bit. So I'm, I'm still trying to get it to a place where it, it, you know, I mean, I think it feels like my paintings, but I want to get it to feel more like my paintings. And so I'm going to continue to work on that. But just the, uh, some of the words and some of the things that come out in the, in the films are definitely, yes, yeah, still connected to that. You know, it's like a little, it's removed. It gets surreal. And, and I think some of that surrealness, um, or maybe uh, disjunctness um, can go fold back into my feelings about my brother and and some of the things he'd say that were just brilliant, but then a lot of times off the wall, yeah. you know. <laughs> and and so I, you know, I'm not afraid of that. And I, there's to me, there's a beauty in that. 
uh, because sometimes he would say things that like I, I, I could never come up with if I tried to create, you know, so right. just the way the brain can work um, off the cuff like that. So um, I, I, I guess I strive for that a little bit in, in, in the, um, you know, I don't know if, it, I don't know how successful I am, but it's, yeah. Of course, I'd say you've been pretty successful at it. I think you're doing oh, thank you. a beautiful job at it. it. You know, on, on, on top of all of this stuff, the book, the films, the paintings, you still got your hand in music and you've released a number of albums over the years, four, you know, five or six of them, uh, including last year's The Average Album, which I thought was really, really good. And Thank you. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm happy to, to know that it's being reissued on, on vinyl and, and you know, yeah. actual media. It's fantastic. Tell me ab- about that record and the, and the decision to, to have it out on vinyl. Yeah, so the you know it's a, a, a the way I create you know there was a time when I could only do one thing and just really concentrate that on that and that was you know with the replacements it was that's about all I could do I couldn't really do anything else I put my energy into that and then that one was when that was over I went you know way into the visual art and painting and trying to figure that that out over the years I've been able to kind of let one thing go and then go to another thing and it's been kind of a good palate cleanser so if I'll be painting most of the time, but then I'll do like, hey, I want to dig into an animation or I want to make some music. And the technology now allows me to be able to bounce around between these things and actually get something done, <laughs> which, you know, which is just amazing. I mean, the, the, the quickness and the tools that are at, at the, the fingertip, at my finger, anybody's fingertips now, you know, with computer technology is, is incredible. So um, it's, it's just, it comes about slowly. So this last record, the average album, uh, it was a collection of songs that built up over time, and then I got enough to say, "Okay, this is a record." And then, and then I wanted to put that out, so I was started releasing things on my website, you know, with just digital downloads. But then, with this book coming out uh, with Rare Bird Books, a uh, uh, publisher that I'm working with now, um, a, this record was done as well, and we had the idea to say, "Hey, because they're they're doing some audio there at Rare Bird as well." So we thought, "Well, why not do a?" A conjunction release with what I have done, and, and it just timed out that way. So I'm always fascinated by individuals that you know have the ability to kind of tap into a, a creative stream within themselves. I mean, you know, there there are some people that that say that you know, that sometimes it evaporates and there's there's nothing there and there's no inspiration and you know I can't do it anymore. Or and then there are other people that where that doesn't seem to be the case, and it and it seems to be your more someone who has been able to have access to like a, a well of, of creativity. Do you ever get to the point where you, you feel like there's a, like a creative block and you're not able to put something together or you, have you not really experienced much of that? I think if I do, it is, you know, I think, um, you know, if I'm not feeling good, maybe I'm depressed about something or sad or there's a loss, you know, I've definitely lost family members in those times of sort of, um, you know, trial, I find it much harder to create. Yeah. And, and that's, that's pretty much would be the times where I sit down and then there's, just, there's not a lot of inspiration. And, and so I got to kind of let the process of those things go by. And then, but then a lot of times there can be a sweetness in, in, in a learning that, that happens through those times that can also accentuate the emotion of what I'm doing once I get back to it. But a lot of times, though, too, I'll have to admit that it can be a therapy. So even when I'm maybe not as happy, I can start creating, and that can that can get me into another space. Right. And I think a lot of the painting or creativity in general is an escape. And so I think um, a lot of uh, you know a lot of whatever's even you know the world can make you sad sometimes sure. if you're tapped into it, especially now. There's so many crazy things going on. So that form of escape can be very valuable, and that can be inspirational um, as well. To where then you don't you're you're not really looking in you know trying to draw from a well. You're just trying to get away from the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know it's 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 interesting because you know you know here you are you're like I said you're you're tapped into this creative well and you're and you're doing great with it and it's been consistent over time. When I look at like you know a couple of years ago, Paul Westerberg decided he wanted to retire from music. And obviously, I'm sure he had his reasons to do that, and, and I don't know if he had a very different experience creatively than than you have. I, have, I mean, do you still keep in touch with him and Tommy? I mean, is there? Oh, sure. Yeah, you do. Yeah, no, we 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 talk from time to time. Yeah, I just 
talked to Tommy, uh, you know, I don't know, a couple of weeks back, you know, and, and it's, you know, it, you know, everybody's kind of doing their own thing. So it's not, it's not, you know, as often, obviously, but it's, it's from time to time. Paul had some losses recently, so mm. I called him for condolences and things like that. So, you know, um, yeah, and I can't really speak, uh, you know, for someone else, but I do know that, um, you know, when somebody has the tiger by the tail and they're just driven and there's the vision is there and it's, they're being propelled by it. I definitely saw that in Paul and I saw that in us for the time. You know, there was a sweet spot in the band where that was really just everything was firing. So I don't know, you know, I can't speak for another artist, but I was probably a little bit of a late bloomer, <laughs> you know, where, where I was more, um, uh, you know, definitely, uh, you know, very interested uh, in the creative process always. That was always premier for me. But, uh, you know, as far as really honing my own vision or something I wanted to say, that came a little later. And then so, yeah, it, it just so I don't know what happens with somebody else, but. But that, but definitely, I saw Paul in that in that mode. So yeah, well, <laughs> hopefully he'll get back into it. Well, so if 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 like just say you know hypothetically speaking, Paul contacted you and Tommy and say, hey, uh, you know, let's together get together and do a little something something. Would it even be a consideration or a possibility, or do you think that for all three of you that is kind of past and and unlikely to happen? Probably unlikely, I would say, especially at this point. I know. The last go around with the reunion, I just was in a in a, a kind of a work mode where I said, ah, I just can't, I can't let everything go what I'm doing now to go do that because it takes a lot of concentration, focus, and energy to even get back in that saddle, you know, for me. And also just age, you know, as a drummer, it was a very, it was almost like a sport rather than a art form. Because yeah, right. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of endurance when you're going on tour. And so I, you know, I think those guys tried it and did it and good for them. And, I, and it was cool to see, but, but um, I don't, I can't anticipate even us being older, that much older yet and trying to get out there and bust a, a tour out, you know, especially with the kind of songs we played, it would be, unless we did them half speed. Well, I, I, was... I, don't, I don't think people would. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing because you know I've I played you know drums very badly since the age of twelve and oh good <laughs> and some friends of mine wanted to to, to get together and, and jam and they first said well let's do a like a Van Halen thing I said okay well that's fine and then they then they sent me a tape or, or like a, a playlist of songs they decided they wanted to do and it's like Ramones and Motorhead it's like I'm uh, I'm almost a sixty year old man <laughs> you know, what what do you I can't do that shit. And they're like, <laughs> they're like, oh, you don't have to do it fast. Like, okay, sure, fine. But I totally understand that. It's like, how are you going to do, uh, you know, I need a goddamn job, you know, at, oh at, my God. at that yeah, speed. Yeah. Can't be done. No, yeah, more cigarettes or something like that from those first, when I listened to those early records, I was like, holy shit, I was, how did I play that fast? I can't even, you know, I can't, I can't even keep up listening. Holy yeah. crap. You know? <laughs> I mean, it is. I mean, it's the nature. And there was another thing, too, it, it, the way I drummed, I, I tried to, I think because we start out, you know, it was like pretty, you know, driving punk yeah. and hard hitting. So I just, I'd hit the hell out of my drums. I'd use the other end of my stick, you know, uh, when I played, I'd, yep. you know, because I'd, I'd break the tips all the time. Maybe you can relate to that, too. <laughs> so, um, you know, and then I had this heavy duty snare skin that wouldn't, because if it was just a regular snare skin, it would be busted in a song or two you know so and then i was going through kick drums so i really hit that kick drum so what happened towards the end was i wore a ridge on the back of my kneecap uh you know i had to go to like uh you know uh, some some whatever sort of therapy to keep going i, I was limping off stage towards the yeah. end there so but i would always try to okay you know what i'm i can maybe change my style and, and not hit you know and then i maybe try to do that for like a song or two and then right by the fifth or sixth song i'm just bashing them again. so it's really hard to unlearn yeah that kind of that kind of you know, the way you learn to begin with is a hard thing to unlearn but, but so is that i think that would be a detriment even trying to get back into that, that was, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe not as bad for if you're a bass player or a guitar player, but I can't imagine that's that easy, too, when you get older. Isn't it funny, though, that, that, that when you do age a as a drummer, you do find ways of getting around the stuff that you can no longer physically do? <laughs> you, you, I mean, you can do it, but it's but you're doing it in a totally different way. You've totally reacclimated yourself to how to do it correctly. Yeah, yeah, I think, I, you know. Yeah, and I don't know if I could uh, correct. I don't know if I could ever get to correctly, but <laughs> <laughs> well, sufficiently. How about that? That's probably a better, there you go. Better sufficiently. Word. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So, some way, you know. And, I, and I've talked to uh, other drummers that are, you know, they've never stopped, and so yeah, they've they've obviously must have 
made their adjustments. But, yeah. Yeah. It's it's an interesting thing. I guess I'll never quite know that. So. <laughs> the uh, the name of the book is uh, 7.42 p.m., The Art of Chris Mars. The vinyl release of the average album is coming out. Uh, people should also look at your website, chrismarspublishing.com. It's just a- amazing stuff. Chris, I, I've, I've really enjoyed talking to you tonight. I'm so glad you were able to take the time uh, uh, away from away from the canvas and away from the uh, the brushes for a little while to, to talk to me tonight. Hey, I, I really appreciate it. Really nice to meet you and, and great conversation. I really, really had fun. So great. thanks, Mike. Thank you so much, Chris. Great to talk to you. The name of the new book is 7.42 p.m., The Art of Chris Mars. Also check out the reissue of The Average Album on chrismarspublishing.com. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember to follow the show on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok for regular updates. You can also email me at bax at rock102.com. I'd love to hear what you think. Thanks again to Metro Chrysler, Dodge Jeep, and Ram at Chickabee for their support. But most of all, thanks to you for listening to Baxi's musical podcast.